Hey everybody, Leah Klett here with the Christian Post, and my guest today is Pastor Matt Chandler. He leads the Village Church in Flower Mound, Texas. Today we're talking about his brand new book, The Overcomers. What's so interesting to me is you're focusing on revelation. This is a really intimidating book for a lot of, of Christians. Yeah. I imagine for a lot of, of pastors. Tell me about the inception of this book and why you wanted to focus on Revelation. Yeah, well, it it kind of didn't start with Revelation. It, it started more with um, like just trying to pastor this church that that God's put me in. And a, after COVID, it it seemed like both spiritually and emotionally, um, like we ended up on our couch for a year. And it was, I was just watching the congregation not get back to those rhythms that that made me love pastoring the church I pastored. These real missional, loving, prayerful, engaging uh, our city, our area uh, with the God. I mean, because I've got this burning belief that for however disorienting these times are, they're our times. Like God's placed us here. Uh, and so the framework of the book is actually the 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 day we were made for the day and the day was made for us like that we've been uniquely wired uniquely placed and uniquely gifted by god for this moment that nobody's coming to bail us out like cs lewis isn't coming gk chesterton isn't coming to kind of you know assess the political climate it's our day and god's not panicked about that like god's actually pretty excited he thinks he's got the right team on the field and um, and so for all the hand wringing and acquiescing or remaining silent in, in this moment of history, I just thought, wait, 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 no, 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 this is, this is perfect for the gospel. I mean, people are so anxious. What an opportunity to introduce them to the one that can take their anxiety. People are struggling with mental health. They're relationally thin. They're what an opportunity for the gospel. So that was really where it began. Uh, and then in my own personal kind of study reading, I had happened upon revelation and and just got my personality type is that if I need to know how something works, I kind of obsess. Um, and so I dove into the book and it for me became, oh, oh my gosh, this book was interpreted a certain way for 2000 years. And now all of a sudden it's interpreted over the last 150 an entirely different way of thinking, approaching. And in some ways it got, and I know this isn't going to make me a lot of friends, in some way it actually got hijacked in, in the 70s in particular. And, and it became this really scary, terrifying. It's always been a bit confusing because it's apocalyptic, but really the book for 2000 years put steel in the spines of Christians, uh, empowered and encouraged them to live boldly as overcomers. And I'm taking that phrase straight from the letters to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3, where Jesus says, to he who overcomes, to he who overcomes. In each one of the churches, he has this promise that if you'll overcome, here's the reward. So here's what you've got to overcome against. And if you'll do that, here is your reward. And man, I, I just... I just had fresh eyes, fresh old eyes for that book. And I was like, this is a book that speaks so perfectly into this moment of history. Let me preach it. And so then I preached it in 2021. And I don't think I've ever preached anything that resonated quite like that. Uh, I mean, you could feel it at the village. But then on top of that, it was getting downloaded like a million times. I mean, it just blew up. And, and so as I considered how I might help, broader evangelicals in this moment. I thought, let me let me write some of this out. And so over the past couple of years, uh, I started turning it into a book. And so that's that's the book. As much as it's about revelation, it's about this idea of we, we're uniquely wired, uniquely gifted, and uniquely placed for this moment for all of God's purposes and not like blue check, celebrity, charismatic type, but stay-at-home moms and the welder and the businessman and the dentist and the the everyday Christian has a key significant role to play in this moment. And I'm just trying to go, let's go get it. What an opportunity we have. Who hijacked this book? I know you're coming at this from a bit of a more reformed yeah. perspective. Yeah, but it's not necessarily a reformed perspective. Reformed people are all over the place in regards to eschatology and certainly all over the place and how they would interpret revelation. I, I would say I'm going back to how the church has viewed this book 
up until Darby 150 years ago, introduces some dispensational aspects to the book. And, and all I'll say about that, and I think dispensationalists aren't the only ones to do this, but when you begin to read Revelation through the lens of your newspaper, you're way outside of what the book of Revelation was intended to do and bring. Um, you, you read in the first chapter that this is clearly a letter to the seven churches in Asia Minor. I mean, that's what it says uh, to the churches in the, you know, to the, this is a letter to the churches in the seven, which means it was written to them, but for us just like Colossians and Philippians. So the idea that Revelation is written just to the last generation before Christ returns is not a, a not a fair way to read the book. Now, it might be fair in that people in the first century thought Jesus was going to return at any moment. But what wasn't in view when the Spirit is telling John and Jesus is sitting with John in this uh, this apocalypse uh, is is, you know, 2020, the 2024 eclipse. That's not in view when this book is written or the wars that are going to be going on in Ukraine and Israel at the time that we're recording this. That's that's not in view to people in 96 AD when they're reading this book because it was meant to encourage them. And their issue is the Roman Empire and these um, these imperial cults in their city. And that that's what's in view for them. And in other ways have been in view for all Christians everywhere, regardless of the time or season or nation in which they find themselves living. Mm -hmm. So you're talking a lot about anxiety, depression. You've talked about how you've seen such an increase in this since COVID. I mean, suicide ideation among young people is at an all time. So high. Yeah. What are some practical suggestions for finding courage and confidence in the midst of all this? And how is this different from, you know, mind control, the power of positive thinking, which is something sure from a lot of secular yeah things. yeah well I, I think a lot of times what we see happening because i do think um right now um because of these things you you see what the apostle paul wrote about in romans where the gentiles will do the law without knowing it that that there is a way that god's woven the world to work so all these kind of mindfulness um stillness all, all these ideas that are being born they're they're actually they're actually Christian concepts. People don't, but probably not aware of it, but these things are all embedded into what it means to follow the way of Jesus. Um, but but the way I, what I write about, is there are these kind of three primary things that I think we've had, we've got to get and, and not just get in our head, not kind of like intellectually get, but like get in our guts, uh, like get in like the deeper places of our being. Uh, and, and the first thing is that that we are made in the image of God, not just us, but all of us are made in the image of God, that humans are distinct in all of creation and that we're like God somehow. We're not God, but we are like him somehow. And that's going to be important, especially in a pluralistic society, for me not to look at the guy who's different than me as bad or wrong, but as an image bearer that, that is completely due dignity and respect and honor. So we've got to get that because we live in a kind of combative time where outrage is what drives clicks. And so I need to understand in the deep places that people are not my primary problem or enemy. Um, the second thing, and I think this has always been true, and, and this I've pastored the same church for 22 years now, I've been in ministry for 30, um, that we have got to understand primary identity, uh, namely that we are children of God. And, and this is that not just, um, you know, Abba, daddy, you know, he's my, you know, I can climb up in his lap and I've got a loving father, but my father happens to be the reigning ruling king of the universe. Um, and, and that's going to embolden me just that identity that I'm a child of God. So more than I'm a pastor, more than I'm Lauren's husband, more than I'm my kid's dad, more than my car, more than my house, more than my job, more than I am a child of God and everything can be taken from me, but that like that, that can that primary identity can't be taken from me if something happens to Lauren, or Lauren just wakes up tomorrow and decides she doesn't love me anymore, or my kids are wild, or they're not wild, um, and that so that identity, that primary identity, is huge, and I think that starts to pull you out of anxiety because if you're not 
If that's not your primary identity, then your job is, or your relationship is, or your money is, or your you fill in the blank, and all the pressure then to be okay lands on you. But if you understand your primary identity is that I belong, I am the beloved of God Almighty. Now, I, I still would love if you liked me, but I don't need you to. I, I would love if my marriage is amazing. But even if it's difficult, if I'm a child of God, I've got a framework that holds me there. If I'm poor or I'm rich, if I'm liked or I'm disliked, I've got this kind of anchor that, that's not going to be blown, you know, that my life and soul is going to be blown all over the place through the highs and lows of life. And then the last thing, and I think this is another thing that pulls us out of um, anxiety and fear, and, and I think maybe even outrage. That, that there's got to be an understanding uh, for you and for me and for everybody listening or watching or reading that we have been uniquely wired by God and uniquely placed by God. And on top of that, uniquely gifted by God for our joy and his good purposes in our lives. So now not only am I beloved by the God of the universe, but he wants to work in and through me alongside of me for his good purposes. And, and I think one of the things that's happened is, is, kind of the individualism of our culture has made such a mess uh, that the church has swung the pendulum way over to the wrong side of things. Because here's the, like, there's never, ever been anyone like you before on earth, Leah, and there never will be again. Like, you, like you are like, like this true one of a kind. And that's less about you and more about the days that God created for you and how he wants to work with you and through you in this moment than it is your self-esteem. But I think these are the three things that start to pull us out of anxiety. Um, the the navel-gazing kind of moral betterment. Uh, Christian Smith, who's a professor at Notre Dame, called it moralistic deism. Like that grid of Christianity creates more anxiety and fear, makes us shrink back more than we should. And, and I, I think we've got to get back to understanding primary identity. My enemies are not humankind and, and that God has a significant and uniquely mine ministry given to me, whether I'm a stay-at-home mom or I'm the CEO of a Fortune 100 company. Now you've worked a lot with X29 Network. Um, you've yeah. talked about your, you've been in ministry for a long time. You kind of plan these missional churches. How do the concepts that you write about in the overcomers align with the challenges and opportunities that you're seeing in new church communities? Well, I man, I think they line up perfectly. In fact, that's another thing that's in view. The whole thing that's in view for me right now is how do you get us up off of our couches and back into this great thing that we've been called to really uh, participation and ultimate reality. That's what I'm talking about. And, and so what church plants tend to do well, that established churches tend to forget is to enter the fray with the biblical compassion and empathy of the kingdom. Um, and so maybe, maybe this story will help. One of the things we've done at the village for the last five or six years is the month, and this is just trying to reclaim some of the stuff I'm talking about, um, is that month is given over to prayer, but in a unique way, in that we ask all of our families to just prayer walk their neighborhoods and pray blessings over the houses in their neighborhood. Just pray that God would bless the marriage, he'd bless the kids, he, he would financially prosper. He would just, just pray blessing over the homes in your neighborhoods. And then each Sunday night, we get together to worship and pray more. And then we give testimonies of spiritual conversations we've been able to have, places we were able to enter in and help, where a neighbor was in need and we had no idea. The number of men and women that are just prayer walking their neighborhood and a neighbor comes out front and they begin to have a conversation. And they're like, we're just, we're just praying blessings over the home. Here's how I prayed for you. Is there anything else you would add? And now all of a sudden we're doing real ministry on our street. And, and these aren't, you know, elders and deacons and small group leaders. Th these are just families walking around their neighborhood doing the work of the kingdom. So on the topic of overcoming, you've dealt with controversy back in 2022. Yeah. Yeah. How did that experience impact your understanding of, of grace, especially in relation to ministry? Um, and how did that experience impact the way you lead the church today? 
Yeah, that's a that's a great question. The the thing about 2021 in particular was that the the kind of culture we had tried to build here uh in that there is accountability, there is a higher standard for a guy like me in public ministry that the fabric held um when I when I stumbled and uh, I was met with both grace and accountability. And they, I, I think what that produced in, in our congregation um, is another visible picture that, that grace is real and, and that there is still at times that there's, there's a payment for um, stumbling that is costly in other areas. And, and so we have seen since um, people more apt to confess more quickly, people serious about um, what I would call language of the village would be little lions in our lives, like small things that could grow into big things. So you got to get them quick when they're little before they become big. Um, and, and we have seen uh, like, like a tremendous amount of trust in the processes we have in place to deal with those kinds of things in the lives of people. And so that that's been the fruit of that. Yeah. As a pastor, you've been through the ups and downs of the ministry. Uh, it's not easy to be a pastor. We see just <laughs> so much. I mean, we talk about mental illness and loneliness and depression. What word of encouragement do you have for pastors who may be struggling with these things today? Because it really is, from what I've seen, a, a pretty lonely position at times. Yeah. I, here, And I think I'm an outlier on this, um, but I don't, I've never bought into that. There's an idea out there that like a, a pastor can't be close friends with the guys that he does ministry with. And I'm just, I know the dangers of that. I Listen, I, I've been involved at the highest level with church planning stuff. The number of stories of men being betrayed and, and like sabotaged by other people in the church or other staff members in the church is a very real thing. Uh, I just, I'm not built um, personality wise to to want to do this by myself. So even in our, even in how we built the church, the leadership structure of the church, I'm one of three lead pastors and, and I might have greater influence because I have the pulpit, but I don't have a greater vote in the room. Um, and man, I have done life deeply with a group of five guys that are on staff with me. It, and the longevity, you know, two of those relationships are over 15 years going now. Um, and the other ones are right at a decade. Uh, and so I have chosen to not give into the, I'm going to carry this thing by myself. And, and I'm going to invite guys into my life. Now, it was, it was a slow process. Uh, I didn't like day one, you know, throw it, you know, be completely vulnerable. But as guys showed me they were trustworthy. I invited them deeper and deeper in. And, and I have, I'm 22 years in at the village now, zero regrets over that. I love the life I get to live with these guys and their wives. And, and I would encourage guys as best they can um, to create a strong circle of trust where they don't have to be the hero, but they can be human. And I say that because they are human. And if you create a world where you're the Messiah, where you're the one that has all the answers, where you're the one that knows everything, you're actually taking a very difficult situation and making it impossible. Um, and so I would encourage any pastor listening to this, reading this, watching this, to begin to create slowly but surely a, a circle of trust for him that's deeply honest and vulnerable for the good of his own soul. I think that's good advice for anybody in any walk of life. Oh, I, absolutely. And all the more so in what's becoming an increasingly unwinnable position in society. Mm -hmm. But what is your <laughs> hope for the overcomers? How do you hope this book will impact the wider church community? So uh, let me let me answer that with this story. Um, at, at the village, uh, a ministry was born that is helping women. Um, get out of sex trafficking. And there's like a 101 and a 201. Um, and there's a dentist in our congregation. It's not an elder. It's not a deacon, a dentist and his wife. And they serve in this area. 
And um, this one woman whose backstory might be the most horrific thing I've ever seen, read, um, heard of in my life. And it started when she was a little bitty girl. And, and it just led her to a level of brokenness and self-destruction and addiction. And she, as she was in 101, was still kind of battling some of that addiction and she fell and and made a significant mistake and CPS got involved. They they wanted to come take her children. And this dentist and his wife intervened and said, hey, we we would love to take care, whatever that, we don't want to adopt, but we'll take care of her children until she meets the requirements and you give her the green light. And, and so right now she's in 201. She's got a she's got a runway now of several months clean. She's getting job training. She's working through trauma counseling. And on the other side of that, they will just sign back over her kids to her. That, that's one example of a thousand I could give you of Christians doing the work of an overcomer in an increasingly hostile world where they're simply giving what they have. They had a house with space. So they did that. It could look like prayer walking your neighborhood. It could look like you, you name it. There's another guy that's opened a bunch of restaurants in our area and he's got a concert venue. Uh, and the first Wednesday night of every month, he does a worship night at that. It's normally Texas country, but, but on uh, the first Wednesday night of every month, it's a worship service put on by the different churches in the area. There's a men's Bible study at his place of business. There's a women's Bible study at his place of business. Now he's just using who he is, where he is, what he has for the kingdom of God. And if you could kind of extrapolate that out uh, across evangelicalism and, and every kind of stay-at-home mom, every welder, every trash man, every businessman, every entrepreneur is engaging with the world around them. They're not acquiescing to culture. They're not being silent, but they're engaging with the love of Christ, with what they have and how they've been wired. I, I think we could see a real renewal and outpouring of the spirit in our day that rivals anything we could see, anything we see in human history. And so I'm writing the book, trying to blow wind into the sails of everyday average people. Too many of us think that the kingdom belongs to blue check charismatic communicators, not how the church has grown across the world, which is the everyday simple faithfulness of normal men and women. And that's what I'm hoping comes from this book.